Okay, so let's get started. Can people on Zoom hear me? Okay, perfect. Okay, so starting from today, we are going to switch gear and talk about something quite different compared with, like, with what we have been talking about so far. So what do we know, right? So if you look back, right, so in, so far we have been learned quite a lot of things about database and we should be pretty proud of it. We know what relational model is, how to organize my data right, into a whole bunch of relations, right? Each relation look like a table, right? It contains a whole bunch of attributes with entities of the same type. It has a whole bunch of entities, right? So a whole bunch of relationships between entities for each of those rows, right? A database right, contains a set of relations. Each relation in terms of schema has a name, has a set of attributes, and for each attribute has a name, has domain, right? So something like this. So I think we all know how to filter data into this relational model. And we also talk about all of these query languages, right? So you, you know all of this, right? Some of them are theoretical, some of them are more practical, right? We spend quite some time trying to write SQL queries about how to load data into database, how to manipulate data, how to query data to get your insight. And then we also know how database actually does it. Right? In the last couple of weeks, we actually tried to open up this black box of a database system, really try to understand layer by layer uh, how does database actually make query answering happen. So this is what we know so far. Right? So I think all of you right now are pretty good users of a database, hopefully, and also a pretty good developer of the database system. So you kind of know how to use a database now. So starting today, we are going to talk about something different. So let's start from an example about how to abuse a database system. So this is actually one example in 2014. So that was the time people are very excited about uh, cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, right? So it was uh, back in the time people have the first uh, Bitcoin bank exchange, something like that, right? You have your digital wallet, and then you can actually do transactions on them. You can withdraw money, you can save money, right? So people were very, very excited about this. Once upon a time in 2014, you will see a new circle like this. That is the first e-bank is get robbed. That is, people start to get more money than they have in their account. If you think about what happened, so you will see a sentence that looks like this. So this is what they have done. So the attacker successfully exploited a flaw in the code, which allows transfer between FlexCon users by sending thousands of simultaneous re requests. The attacker was able to move coins from one user account to another until the sending account was overdrawn before balances are updated. So that's the reason. If you actually think about what actually happened, that's going to something we are going to fix in the next couple of weeks. So here's actually what happened. If you think about this example, it's actually very easy to understand. So back then, if you look at how the system was constructed, all the information about the user, all the information about all the accounts, actually stored in a, not surprisingly, a database system called MongoDB. So back in 2014, MongoDB actually doesn't support transactions. Right? You are going to learn what that really is really soon. But essentially what's going to happen is if someone wants to withdraw some money from the account, this is actually, I mean, conceptually what happens. The system is going to run these four different steps, right? So first of all, I'm going to read my balance to check how much money I really have in my digital wallet. And then I will update my balance. I want to withdraw 10 francs, right? So I update my balance, save that as a new balance. And then I update my database to say, OK, so this is a new balance, OK? And then I withdraw the money. There's four different steps. So if you have two concurrent withdrawals, right? So the same user try to withdraw 10 francs, right, from the same account, what would happen? And then that actually depends on how those instructions, these four different instructions, get mixed together. You could have a case that you get lucky that one of the transactions that you have happens earlier, right? So I issue 
two withdraw request, and uh, it, 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 and it's, it's entirely possible when the system doing the scheduling, right? All the four requests, uh, all the four instructions from the first request is being scheduled before the second request. So if you think about what would happen here, right? So let's try to reason about really how much money you have from the perspective of the, of the database system. In the beginning, you have like 100 francs, right? If you read this value from database, you get 100, you update it, you write it back, and you withdraw 10 francs. And then you continue to run the second request. In this case, yeah, if you read again, what do you get? You get 90, right? Because that is the new value inside database being updated by the first request because you withdraw 10 francs out of it. You keep doing this, you get 80, 80, then you get this 10 francs. We see the system is correct. If, if you add these three different values together, 10, 10, and 80, you should get 100. Right? Otherwise, you get more money, right? or a fewer amount of money, right? which neither one. I mean, we like one of them, but the bank doesn't. Right? But you can actually mix those instructions together. And that is actually what happened in this real case. So hypothetically, if you mix your instruction this way, you run the first instruction of the first transaction first, and then you move on to the first instruction of the second transaction and do this zigzag type of pattern. So let's try to look at together what would happen. In the beginning, the first transaction, we'll get how much money? We'll get 100, right? Because that's how much money you have. The second transaction, when they read the state, we will also get 100. You continue to do this in the eye of the first database system, right? When they write the whole thing back, it's going to write 90 back, right? And when the second transaction writes things back, it's also going to write back 90. And both will give you 10 francs. If you really add these three things together, you actually have 110 francs now. Because how those instructions are being mixed together. And imagine you have thousands of those concurrent transactions. And that is how people get millions of dollars out of that Bitcoin exchange. So this is something that we really want to fix. If you think about why do we have such a thing, right? The fundamental thing is we are actually missing another level of abstraction that we need to tell the system, okay, I have a whole bunch of instructions I want to do. They form a group. You cannot mix those instructions with other things, otherwise there will be a problem. That abstraction is missing so far. Right? In the SQL statement that we have been talking about so far, you have no idea how to do that. And that is actually something we are going to talk about starting today. It's really try to introduce the notion called a transaction. A transaction is a group of instructions that database know is a group. And then you try to enforce different properties about that group such that this case won't happen. Now let's look at another example. I think this is one probably most of you guys should be pretty familiar with. I think most of you will probably see this screen at some point, probably last year, right? When you try to book an uh, appointment to the vaccine, right? So in the first version of the system, I think this is actually one year ago, something like that. So one frustration is actually you pick your slot. You need to pick two, right? You, you pick these two slots. You click OK. And then it's going to show up something like this. It tells you the appointment that, uh, that, that you picked has been booked by somebody else in the meantime. What happened, right? So what happened is actually very natural if you think in the view of a database system because all the information you have about vaccination and appointments are actually inside the database system. Whenever you are trying to book something, right, we are talking about this four very simple steps conceptually. Right? You try to get all the available list of appointments right, and then by searching the database, and then you pick one and then you book it. And then you search the database to get a second list of appointments. It's two weeks after the first one, right? And then you book it, and then you commit. You say, okay, I'm, I'm done. When there are multiple people booking vaccinations, right, what's going to happen 
is you cannot have this type of conflicts, right? You cannot have two people booking the same slot. So you need to check these four different pairs to see whether there are conflicts or not. And whenever you are clicking the button to say, okay, I want to book it, it actually issues a commit uh, statement to say this transaction end, I want you to reflect all the changes I want to make. And then if there's any conflicts that you have uh, from your tra like, uh, like transaction and also other people's transaction, the system will say, okay, I cannot do that, right? Either I ask someone to, to, to keep waiting, right? Or I just roll back to say, yeah, I cannot book that for you, try again, right? So in two weeks, you are going to know how to reason about different ways of enforcing this type of isolation behavior from transactions. You can ask people to wait, or you can do this rollback type of thing. So these are the two examples that are going to inspire what we are going to study in the next couple of weeks. So specifically today, we are going to talk about a new abstraction in the data management system called transaction. And we are going to look at even more concrete examples about why we need that. And then we are going to talk about the desired property of transactions and think about how those properties can help us avoiding all those problems. Okay, so for simplicity, let's make several assumptions because we are going to change a little bit how we think about database logically. So starting today, we are going to think about database as a collection of objects, okay? We are not going to do detail about the table, the tuple. We think about it as a collection of objects. For example, each row corresponds to one object. In some cases, each cell corresponds to objects, right? So we think about database as this hierarchical structure over a whole bunch of objects, okay? And then we assume we only have a single thread inside database running things. Okay? We assume there's no concurrency. Uh, if there are con con like concurrency in the system, the whole thing becomes a little bit more, more fuzzy, but right now we assume there's only a single thread. If a user submits two SQL queries at the same time, the database can run one instruction at one time. It, it could mix the instructions from both SQL queries, but it's going to run one thing at a time. Okay? That's our basic assumption. So why do we need transactions? So the reason we need transactions is that given this powerful collection of SQL queries that you can write, if you're not being careful, you can actually make a whole bunch of inconsistency problems inside your system. Now, inconsistency can happen at, for example, attribute level. So just look at this SQL query. Okay, assuming you have a table contains uh, information about some college, right? I have that enrollment number, right? To say University X have this many students. This SQL query is going to actually increase that value by 1,000, for example. And you could have another SQL query, right? So you can say, yeah, um, I will increase that by 1,500 instead. If someone run these two SQL queries, at the exactly the same time, what should we expect the answer to be? So there are actually different potential outcomes coming out of this. So assuming X, the object, corresponding to the enrollment of, uni of University X, that's the value you want to update. If you think about what the first query is trying to do, yeah, it's simply doing this, right? You read X from your database to a variable A, you increase A by 1,000, you write it back, right? It's as simple as that. For the second query, it's doing something very similar, right? It read X, increase by 1,500, write it back. When we issue these two things together, right, there are actually different ways for these instructions to get mixed, and which might lead to very different result. And we call each specific way of mixing those instructions a schedule. So let me show you one schedule. One possible way, one possible schedule of running these concurrent queries is to say we run T1 first, the first transaction, and then we run T2. So here A is local to each transaction, right? And then you get a schedule that looks like this. 
In this case, right, we are going to keep doing this exercise for more complex things, but let's try to make sure we are on the same page about how we think about it. There's always the internal state of T1, then there's the internal state of T2. They are the state that only those transactions knows, and then there's a database state, which is shared across different transactions. Okay? We always think in this way. In the beginning, for example, we have x equals to 10,000. That's in the database. Okay? And then we run the first instruction. In this schedule, you will run T1 first. The first instruction is going to read from the database state and bring that to something local to this transaction. It's going to set A equals to essentially 10,000, right? because you read that from database. And then you update the internal state. A become 10, uh, like 11,000. But this doesn't change the database, OK? And this doesn't change T2. It's very important, OK? And then T1 write it back. When T1 write it back, it's going to influence essentially, essentially uh, the database state. In this case, after T1 write it back, it's going to have 11,000 in the database state. And then T2 read it, get 11,000 increase it, and then write it back. If you look at this, given this schedule, given this input, you have a new state of the database. This schedule is a transformation that takes as input a database state in which x equals to 10,000, and transform that into a new state where x equals to 12,500. Okay? This is one example. But you could mix them in different ways. Right? You could do this. In the beginning, you have 10,000, right, the same state. And then you run first instruction, your A equals 10,000. You run your second uh, like, uh, like instruction in T2, right, A equals 10,000. You increase this value in T1. You increase this value in T2. But in the meantime, your database state doesn't change. Okay? If there's some other transaction, read X, you get the same number. You write it back from T1, you go have 11,000, and you write it back from T2, you get 11,500. If you put these two different transformation of states side by side, you can see that given different ways you are mixing those uh, instructions for different schedule, you are going to take as input a database of in the same state and transform them into a different database states. Okay, they're going to have different values. So clearly, this is not really what we want in the database system. The thing we want to make sure is when the user are running something, we have certain level of deterministic behavior that we are expecting from the database system. We don't really want this. And inconsistency can happen at a higher level. You could have inconsistency at the top level. So now let's look at this example. Assume we have this SQL query. We have a whole bunch of students, right? Uh, each student have the ID, right? Have a major, have the semester, for example. So this is one user comes in, issue this query. I want to set the major of the student one two three to CS. And another user comes in, set the semester number to ten. If you run this together, right? So assuming X corresponds to a tuple for the students. So what you are going to do is going to uh, T1 going to read X, change the major, write it back. T2 going to read X, change semester, write it back. And you can mix them in different ways. And you can see different type of inconsistent behavior. The first way is you have this serializable, like, like this, this serial kind of way of running them. You run T1 first, you run T2. Right? In this case, assuming the student's state in the beginning is a mathematics and nine, for example. After T1, Right? You are going to have CS9, because only change the major. Then T2 read that. And then change the semester, you have CS10. So far, so good. We're on the same page about what this means. Right? Because we are going to look at way more complex schedule down the road. It's, it's clear, right? OK. You can mix them in different ways. What if we do this? Right? In this case, you start from mathematics 9. T1 get mathematical 9, T2 get uh, mathematical 9, T1 change the major, T2 change the semester, 
T1 write it back, and you have CS9 in the state, and T2 write it back, you have mathematic 10. Right? And you could arrange them in different ways. You could run the first instruction of T2 first, for example, then you have uh, this transformation of the state. If you put these three different things together, and you can see they're actually giving you different tuples. There is also inconsistency between different attributes of the same tuple, if you're not really careful about that. And inconsistency can happen at even higher layer. You could have, for example, table level inconsistency. This is another example. Assuming I'm, I have this SQL query, I say, yeah, for all the students with GPA higher than 3.9, I set my song decision for application to yes. Okay? And then I have another SQL query to update the GPA of students uh, by multiplying that number by 1.1 and make GPA, like all the GPA for all the students higher. If you look at these two transactions, how to run those things? So there are different type of schedules, okay? There's a one schedule where you run the second query first, you update all the GPA for all the students, and then you make a decision of application. Okay, that's fun, that's fun, right? And then there could be another schedule that you run T1 first, you first make a decision, then you update the GPA, right? And there's another one which look a little bit weird, that is, during my process of updating my GPA, I also make decisions. For some students, I make decisions using the old GPA. For some students, I'm making the decision using a new GPA. That's not fair at all, right? So if you look at these three things, we actually do not want the last thing to happen. We want to make sure it's either the first schedule or the second schedule. That is actually what we want. But if you're not being careful, if you don't have notion of transaction, just applying what we have, right, from the beginning of the semester to last Friday, you could have the third thing. There's nothing stop you from having the third one if all you know how to do are just running those SQL queries. And you can have more. You have even higher level transaction beyond the table level. This is another example. So assuming I have uh, essentially uh, two tables. So I have the application table, contains all the applications, and then I have another table called archive. So what I'm going to do is, for all the applications where the decision goes to N, I put them into archive, right? And then for all the other things, uh, decision equals to yes, I keep them in the application table, in the apply table. And then periodically, I could also run another collection of SQL queries. I could have a SQL query really count how many tuples you have in the apply table, and then I can count how many tuples I have in the archive table. In the ideal world, if you were the second user, the second transaction, probably the expectation you are having is these two numbers sum up together should equals to the total number of people who applied. That's not a crazy expectation to have, right? So there are schedules going to have it. You could run, for example, uh, just T2 first, and then you run T1, then you are going to have that. If you run T1 first, then you run T2, you will have that. But if you put them together, if you run the aggregation query on apply first, then run these two different query, uh, then run one of these query, then run the, 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 the count query on archive, then you run the second query here, then you are going to have inconsistency, right? So you sum up those numbers, you are going to have a different value. So that is actually not something we want. So essentially, when multiple groups of SQL statements and instructions are running at the same time, what we want from all the previous example is we want the effect as if they are executed sequentially. Physically, we don't want them to run sequentially because it's going to be slow, but we want to have the same effect. So this is, a goal. This is one of the goals of transaction. 
if you look at this, right, there's a naive solution for this, right? You want the execution to be equivalent to a sequential run, uh, then a very naive solution to this is we can build the database can only run one SQL statement or one transaction at a time, right? So which is fun. That gives you the right solution, right result. But the problem is that's going to be pretty slow. The goal of transaction as a system is really try to enable concurrency whenever it is safe to do so. And we will define what is actually safe because there's multiple dimensions about that. So the second thing we want from a transaction is to deal with system failure. Because when you are using a database system, right, so you are keeping a record for tens of years, right? And that's, that's reasonable. I and mean, you are saving money in the bank. You don't want the bank to like, forget about your account in a day. So there are going to be system failures during that really long period of time. Another way of thinking about transaction is really try to deal with that. So assuming you have this SQL query, right? It's a, it's a backload, right? You, you just have a CSV file on your disk. You try to load them into your relation. So what could happen? What if the system fail in the middle? You are loading your data, and someone put the plug of the machine. When I reboot the machine, what am I expecting in my database? So there are three different possible states, right? You could have a case that this relation is empty. None of those tuples are loaded. In this way, I'm fun. I'm fun, right? So it is, I'm loading in the middle, I put a plug, I reopen, nothing's there. I just reload it, right? I mean, in the end of the world. The second state is all the changes are in. I'm getting really lucky, right? So this, this query is almost done, right? But before it can tell me it's done, someone put a plug. When I reboot the machine, all the changes are there, yeah, I'm happy. The thing I do not want is a thing in the middle. That is, I reboot the system. Some of the tuples are in, some of the tuples are not. I'm, I'm having a database that is actually halfway done. So that could be very hard to fix because I don't know what to do. I have a database that's not consistent. To fix it, I have to compare what I loaded with my file. That's not something we want to do. In this case, it's very easy to fix. But the moment you have something more complex, that becomes very hard to fix. So this is not something we want. We want either the first state or second state, but not the third one. So there are more about system failure, right? For example, you have the two queries. The first one tries to do the archive. The second one tries to remove tuples, right, to keep those uh, decision equal to yes in apply. What if the system fail in the middle? The user is running this transaction, these two queries, and the system just fail. So we will reopen the database. We want to make sure either both of these queries changes are reflected in the database, or none of the changes are inside the database. We do not want the case that the first query already finished running, but the second query haven't. Because if that is the case, I have a database state that's actually not consistent, that doesn't reflect this reality, right? I'm, I'm losing a whole bunch of people, right? So any other states are kind of dangerous in general because they give you something inconsistent. So transaction is really try to fix that. So what is a transaction? A transaction is a sequence of one or more SQL operations treated as a unit. When you have concurrent transactions, they appear to run in isolation, sequentially. When the system fail, each transaction changes are either reflected entirely or not at all. Not in the middle. This is what we want from the notion of transaction. The way to do it is you have the sequence of operation you want to do, you just wrap it up. Begin transaction, end the transaction. That's high level what it is. And more concretely, right, so there is a, sing a single way you begin a transaction is by having a statement called begin, but there are actually two different statements you can do to end a transaction. You could commit 
as the last statement. If you commit, it means that the transaction has finished, and I want you to reflect all the changes I've been making inside this transaction. The transaction succeed. So, and then once you issue commit, the database is going to confirm to the client when all the changes of the transaction has been made persistent. Mm -hmm. You could also abort a transaction. You can say, I've been running a whole bunch of things. I don't want those anymore. I want to cancel my transaction. You can also have another statement called abort as the end of the transaction. If you issue that, you are telling the database, okay, I want to cancel it. Database is going to roll back all the changes that you have been doing inside that transaction. And in PostgreSQL, we'll, there's a one thing called auto commit. We will turn that on. Essentially, uh, PostgreSQL is going to treat every single SQL query you type in uh, as a transaction. It's going to automatically wrap up that for you. So it's very simple, okay? So what's interesting is once you have the notion of transaction, we can think about different properties we want from the notion of transaction. So these are the four properties, and we are going to go through them one by one. There's one called automaticity, meaning that a transaction that's executed is in, uh, like, like need to be executed is in entirety or not at all. You will never see kind of uh, an inconsistent database with things in the middle. And then there's something called consistency, right? It means that a transaction going to uh, kind of transform a, a database from a consistent state in which all of those integrity constraints are respected into another consistent state that all of the uh, integrity constraints are respected. There's a third one called isolation, which means that if you have multiple transactions running at the same time, it is as if each one of them is only transaction in the system. You are going to have the same result as if you are running those transactions one by one. There's another property called durability, which essentially means that once I commit a transaction, your result will be there. I cannot lose your, uh, so, so I cannot lose uh, the result of a committed transaction. Even though you put a plug on the system, I should be able to recover the result, the changes made by a committed transaction. So in the next couple of weeks, we are going to think about from the algorithm side, from the system side, how to enforce these four different properties. And the goal of today is really try to get on the same page about what each of these properties really mean. So let's start from isolation. Because that is something kind of easier to understand. And not, I, mean, I think all of them are easier to understand, but this is something we are already pretty familiar with. So what is isolation? Right? So essentially, we will run multiple transactions so operations, each instruction, can be interleaved, right? But execution must be equivalent in terms of the result to some sequential order of running those transactions. Essentially, you have three transactions, for example, T1, T2, and T3. We want, whenever you, you, you run this, we want to make sure your result will be the same as one of these sequential orders. So there's essentially uh, like six of those, right? We want to make sure avoided execution of these three transactions together will be the same or equivalent, right, to one of these six possible zero executions. We don't care which one it is, okay? But we want to make sure there exists a sequential execution order of those transactions that's the same with my schedule. And we will define what do we mean by equivalent really soon, because it's not really trivial to, read, to really say what really means by equivalent. If that is true, we call an execution and schedule serializable, which means that you are able to find a, a serial execution order of the transaction that's the same as this one. So, Let's look at these two things, right? So we, we, like we understand these two transactions now. Right? One try to increase x by 1,000, another try to increase x by 1,500. There are two possible zero orders here. You could run T1 first and then run T2, right? That's one zero order, which is going to transform the database state from 10,000 to 11,000 to 12,500. 
there's another zero order that you run T2 first, and then you run T1, which is going to do a different transformation. Coincidentally, they reach the same point, which is 12,500. Essentially, what, whatever way you choose to mix their instructions together, at the end of the day, I want to make sure it reach one of these two possibilities, which happen to be the same. If you give me a database system uh, like that output something different, we will run these two things together, I will not be happy. Okay? So that is the requirement from serializability. And similarly, if you look at this example, right? So there are two different ways you can arrange a zero order out of these two transactions. You run T1 first, right? Then you get CS10 in the end. You run T, uh, T2 first, you get, happens to get the same thing. I mean, you don't have to, but, but in this case, you get the same thing. All the way the execution of these two transactions need to either equivalent to possibility one or equals to possibility two. I also look at this case. This is about decision making and the increase in the GPA of students, right? You have two possible zero order. You run T1 first, that is you make decision first, and then you increase the GPA. And then second zero order is you run update the GPA first, and then you make a decision. However you want mix all those instructions together, you need to lead to one of these two. If that happens, we see the isolation property is respected. So here, if you look at these two zero orders, right, they will give you different result. Making decision first or updating GPA first is going to give you something different. It is not a job for a database system, at least in the scope of this course, to pick one over the other. Because the system has no idea which one you like. If you really want the database to pick one over the other, you need to enforce it at the application level, not at the database level. The contract between the database system and the user is I'm going to give you one or the other. It's fine. I'm not going to tell you which one I'm going to pick. If you have two transactions running at the same time, it could go either way. That's the contract coming out of the serializability part. So similar, we have this, right? You can actually uh, update your archive and apply table, and you count the number of uh, tables in you know, apply, and number of tables in archive, right? There are only two possibilities. That is, you update your data, you do your statistics, right? Or you do your statistics, and then you update your data. A valid execution should give you uh, the same result as one of this. So here, these two possibilities will give you a very different result. Okay? But it's okay from the system perspective. Again, if you want one possibility over the other, it is your job from the application side to make that happen. Okay? The second property that we care about is called durability. Essentially, it means that if the system crashes after a transaction commit, all the changes of that transaction will remain in the database when you reboot it. So for example, when you have this high level of things, like if you go to a bank, deposit your money, once the bank tells you it is done, you don't worry about it, like it at all. You don't care whether after the bank tells you it's done, whether the building collapses, all those type of things, right? The money will be there because, yeah, the bank promised you it's there. So that is actually what we want. So assume you have a transaction that looks like this with two different SQL queries. The ability essentially means that assuming the system crashes after commit, when you reboot your system, you will see all the changes coming from this transaction in the database. Okay? It's not going to say, okay, yeah, I told you it was committed. No, but I don't want that anymore. I want to change your committed transaction. That will never happen because of the durability of this property okay? that we want to enforce. Another similar thing, very different but kind of similar, is called automicity. So essentially it says that each transaction is essentially all or nothing. Okay? You never left things halfway done, no matter when the system crashes. So essentially, if you look at 
the difference between atomicity and durability. Durability worries about the cases that the system crashes after commit. But atomicity worries about the cases where the system crashes in the middle. What if the system crashes here? After it runs SQL 1, but hasn't run SQL 2 yet, and then the system crash. What should we do? In this case, right, Automicity actually tells you if you reboot your database, okay, and I look at what's inside, I will not see SQL 1's effect being reflected in the recovered database. Okay? Because uh, the like, transaction is, is all or nothing. There's no way I can do all because I haven't run SQL 2 yet. Okay? So the only choice I have is to give you nothing. I'm going to roll back all the changes that SQL 1 made on my database when you recover from the failure. And what if the system fail here? It's a very unlucky time to fail. Is I run everything, SQL 1 is done, SQL 2 is done. That right before I tell you I'm done, system crashes. And then reboot system. What do we need here? So here we have a little bit of leeway. Right? Essentially, Automicity means that I'm okay for these two possibilities. Either you roll back all of them if you are really done. Okay? So you can roll back SQL 1, you can roll back to SQL 2, you can roll back all the choices as if nothing happened when you recover from a failure. It's fine. Or you keep all the changes of SQL 1 and SQL 2 and uh, tell me it is done. So either all the changes are in, or none of them are in. Okay? As long as one of this happens, I'm happy from the automicity perspective. Make sense? Is the difference between automicity and durability clear? Durability is after commit, automicity is in between. Make sense? Okay. And then there's another property called consistency. So in this case, essentially, if you have a whole bunch of uh, like, uh, like, uh, like, like transactions, right? In the beginning, you have a database that is consistent. So here we have a very precise way to say what is, well, what is consistent, that is all the integrity constraints, okay? All the integrity constraints are respected at that moment. So that's a consistent database instance. So essentially, we will have a consistent uh, database state, and you run a single transaction, what you want from the consistency property is the output of the transaction, the new state, is also going to become uh, like, 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 always, like uh, they're also going to be consistent, okay? So, and then a consequence of this is when you have those multiple of those uh, transactions run together, because you have serializability. That is, even though I'm running multiple at the same time, it is as if I'm running them sequentially. Because of serializability, if each of the transaction on itself is consistent, at the end of the day, you are running multiple of those, it's also consistent. Because whatever result you are going to have is going to be equivalent to a serial execution order where you run these consistent transactions one by one. So these are the four different properties. So about consistency, there's actually one thing that's a little bit interesting is about when should you check the consistency. Because there are a whole bunch of changes you could make on your database. And your database consists or not actually depends on when should you check it. In PostgreSQL, right, so, or in most of the SQL standard, this is what's going to happen. You can actually set, when, 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 you, when you declare the, 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 the scheme of the relation, try to tell the system when to check. For example, like, uh, like, uh, like by default, right, so, all the check constraint is going to be checked for every single row, okay? And every single, for example, not null constraint is going to be checked when you change one row. Uh, all the unique is also row level. All the foreign key is going to check statement by statement, okay? But you can change that. You can change the behavior. You can say, uh, I, I, like, like, I, like I want you to, for example, defer some of the checking if you do the initially deferred, like that setting, 
right? You can actually change the checking of foreign key constraint to the transaction level. That is, you have multiple statements in the transaction. I'm not going to check that one by one. I'm going to check that once you finish the whole transaction, okay? There's a whole bunch of things that you can do. We are going to look at some examples once we take a break. Yeah, let's take a break, and uh, when we get back, we look at examples. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so we talk about consistent checking and uh, when that would happen, right? So let's look at some quick examples to really try to reason about the behavior of this. Okay, let's look at, oh, that can be even bigger, I guess. So let's look at this. On one hand, I declare my schema, right? So I have a relation S with one attribute SID. I have another relation R with uh, one attribute, uh, sorry, uh, two attributes, RID and SID, and there's a foreign key from R to S, right? So this is my schema. On the other hand, uh, I'm trying to run these four different SQL queries. Inside S, I insert two values, one, two, Right, in R, I introduce another one and two, right? And then you can see the foreign key constraint will be fine. And then I try to delete one tuple from S where S ID equals to one. And then I try to delete another tuple from R where R ID equals one. If I run this, what would happen? Who think it will fail? Who think it will not? Who need more time reading it? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a foreign key from R to S. I delete the tuple from S that some R tuple relies on. Then I also delete some tuple in R. At the end of the day, it's going to be fun if you check in the end, right? So if you run this together, it's going to look like this. It's going to fail, right? If you look at what error you are going to get in PostgreSQL, it's going to look like this. Essentially, the update or delete on this table violates foreign key constraint. Essentially, the error happens after you run this. If you think about why, it's because the foreign key constraint checking by default is actually happens uh, after every single statement. So another thing about this is what if I do this? Now we know this fancy notion of transaction. I have the transaction here. I have this. I wrap it up as a transaction. This weird button always. I have this. What if I do this? What will happen? Yeah. The previously is very kind of natural to understand why they fail, right? You run one statement, I check. Right, how can I know these two tuple, like, like these two single queries are together, right? What, ha yeah, what happens here? Automaticity is about recovery. It's always about something fail and you reboot. Yeah, yeah. So this pretty much, it's kind of like uh, about consistency, like in, like in this case. What would happen if I wrap it up as a transaction? Who think it will fail? Who think it will not fail? Let's try to run it together. Where is the button to run that? Oh, here. Yeah, it's going to fail. Okay. Why? What happened? Now, this is a transaction. Come on. <laughs> what happened? What happens? We go back to the previous table. Where's my cursor? If you go back to this table, okay, and try to see, okay. Here, we worry about what type of constraint. We worry about the foreign key constraint. And we try to understand this. By default, the checking of the foreign key constraint, no matter where you are, is going to happen at statement level. This is what that thing means. It means I don't care whether you wrap it up. When am I going to check the constraint? By default, I'm going to check it after statement. So this is how to interpret like, this, this thing inside the table. 
what should we do? What if we want the system to check it right later, right? As you can see, you can actually set different condition here. You can say, yeah, here, I want you to check other transaction level. All you need to set is to declare this thing inside your schema. So let's try to do that together. Uh, if I can find my window. OK, it's here. So the thing you can do is when you define a constraint, you can put something that look like this. You can say this constraint is deferrable, and this, the, 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 like the way you want to defer the check-in is initially deferred, which is actually the corresponding to the last thing, like this thing. Okay? You can set it. Once you set it and you run it, it's going to be hopefully fun. It's going to be fun. Okay? It's going to be fun. Essentially, what happens is the system knows, okay, when should I check this constraint? I should check it after the transaction is done. Make sense? Now let's look at another example. I want to change my. Let's look at another example. Okay. This is a simple one. On one hand, I have one relation, R, with two attributes, A and B. And I have one constraint that says a plus b in two equals to 100. On the other hand, I insert a tuple into r, 50, 50. OK, it's fine. Right? And then I try to set a equals to 40, and then I try to set b equals to 60, and then I do another selection, whatever. What will happen if we run this? Who think it will fail? Fail? Not fail? Yeah, and this one will fail for sure, right? Come on. And this one will fail, right? So, I mean, essentially, I mean, I don't have information if I'm a system, right? You ask me to update A equal to 40, what am I going to do? Hoping there's another one? Hey, come on. I mean, no system will behave like that, right? So I'm going to run this. I'm going to check it, right? So in this case, it's very natural that it's going to fail. What if I do this? I wrap it up as a transaction. What would the system do? Well, you go back, check the table. You have this a different type of constraint now, right? You have this check constraint. That's what you have. By default, it's going to check at the row level. That is, whenever you are updating some row in the relation, you check it. Okay. So once we know this, we can go back to this example and to reason about what would happen, right? So it doesn't matter whether you are wrapping it up as a transaction or not. The checking of this condition by default is going to happen at the row level. The moment I change the first one, I'm going to check it. Right? So therefore, if you run it, it's actually going, going to fail. What if I do this? Oh, sorry. What if I... What if I do this? What will happen? Yeah, exactly. Right? So if you have this, right, if you look at the table, it still check out the row basis, so it, it will still fail. I think in PostgreSQL, you are getting a different error message. Uh, yeah, essentially, it, it's tell you that cannot be deferred, something like this. Okay. So you cannot do this for check. But even if you are able to, uh, it's going to actually check row by row. Okay? Uh, the question uh, in the chat window, isn't the default to do nothing? No, no, no. So default uh, for, for, for the constraint, default, you, you, like you are going to check, right? By default, you are not going to defer the check. -in. That's the default. Yeah. OK, any, any questions? Any questions so far? No? So, I mean, you, you don't have to remember this table. Whenever we, we, we do it, we are going to, in the exam, assuming if we do this, we are going to give you the table. But how to read it, how to think about it, that's the most important thing, okay? And knowing you need to think about that, that's important, okay? 
No one remember this table. I don't remember this table. Yeah. Okay. But I know this table exists. Yeah. Okay. So these are the four properties that we want out of transactions, right? We want automaticity, always about recovery, right? We want consistency, right? We want isolation, and we want uh, durability, right? Here, one thing that to keep in mind is whenever we talk about automaticity and durability, there's always about recovery, something failed, okay? And then when we talk about isolation, we talk about those kind of multiple uh, like transactions Right, we want to make sure they're isolated. Uh, whenever we talk about consistency, right, we talk about one transaction, give you a consistent transformation of the database state. So whenever you are having the notion of transaction inside the system, the goal is really try to enforce automatically all these four properties. So after we know the property that we want to enforce, I guess the next question is really, why is this really hard? Getting transactions right is extremely hard. That's actually why Jim Grave in the Turing Award, because of transaction. But why is this hard? I mean, there is a baseline implementation, right? We could enforce it in the following way. That is, I have a database system. I always run transactions one by one, okay? I don't care how many transactions you give me. I run them one by one. So isolation is fine. Before the begin statement, I just dump my database into a file. Okay, just save it, just dump it into a file. And then I run it, run whatever you have, and before commit, I will dump my database into another file. And then if it's commit, I give back to the user to say committed. If you abort, I will read the old file, load into the database, I'm done. This very simple implementation will give you all of these four properties. Why? Think about automaticity, right? You fail in the middle. When you reboot, you know you're in the middle. Right? You keep some flag for that. And you always roll back. You have the old file inside database before you run the transaction. You recover. You just copy it, right? It's fun. Automaticity is fun. Consistency, well, that's more like what the transaction is doing, right? So that's fun. Isolation, fun. I'm running transaction one by one. By definition, my schedule is serializable because it is serial, right? Of course, it can be serialized. Durability, fun. Once I tell you it's committed, I have that file, right? Copied inside my database, right? If you, if you fail after commit, yeah, I reboot, I load a new file. It's fun. This gives you some implementation that allow you to run a whole bunch of transactions with all these four different properties. But of course, right, what's the problem? The problem is very slow, right? There's no concurrency, right? We are not mixing those instructions. So it's a huge overhead. Every single time you run something, you just dump the whole database, right? So this is not how database works. The thing we want to understand is not really how to enforce these four properties because enforcement itself is not that hard. What we want to understand is how to enforce those four properties as cheap as possible and as fast as possible. If you look at the database system, like people are running in banks, right? Every single second, you are measuring the number of transactions you are going to run by millions, right? The million transactions per second, that's, that is the unit people are using to measure a database system. So this is the level we are talking about. We want to build a system that's cheap enough and fast enough that we can handle millions of transactions on a single machine. That is what we want. And that is why building the transaction part of the database system is extremely hard. And we are going to talk about that, I think, on Friday, about yeah, how to enforce some of this. You are going to see it's, a, it's actually pretty delicate. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, if you're not being careful, you could make a lot of errors uh, in kind of try to enforce it. But today, we are going to talk about a higher level, what properties we want. Now, let's go a little bit deeper into isolation, because we could do more on the, less, uh, on the isolation side. So essentially, here, we essentially talk about two different extremes of the isolation model. One extreme is we don't really care about isolation. You just keep running whatever, whatever you want to run, 
right? Another extreme is I only allow those schedules that are serializable. I only allow the schedule that's equivalent to some serial run. But there are things in the middle, and those are the things you are able to do if you are a user of a database system. Why do you want to do the things in the middle? Because achieving isolation in a serializable way right, could be expensive, and sometimes you may not care about that strong guarantee. Sometimes maybe you don't care the whole thing is serializable. You can tolerate a certain amount of inconsistency when you query the data, then why pay the cost? Right? In practice, database gives you a different level of isolation that you can actually enforce. So the way to think about it is really try to think about isolation as the avoidance of problems. So there are these different, four different levels of isolation that you can actually do inside a database system. In the beginning, you have this serializable thing, which is really, 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 really restrictive. And then you can actually go down, have different levels. There's one level called repeatable read, there's a level called read committed, there's another level called read uncommitted. You can see about these different levels as this. Going from the bottom to the top, it's become more and more expensive for to enforce those. And then going from the top to the bottom, you are allowing more and more concurrency. You are actually allowing more and more different type of ways for you to mix in those instructions. So that's how to think about it. So let's go through this isolation level. So isolation level is the property of each transaction. For each transaction, you can have a different isolation level. This is not really clear why this is really possible. But as you will see how we define this isolation level, it will become clear, okay? So for example, we will have these three different transactions, T1, T2, T3. You can just specify, okay, I want T1 in the isolation level, read, uh, repeatable read. I want T2 as read and committed. I want T2 as serializable, something like this. So isolation level is a property of a transaction. Which, to be honest, is pretty mysterious why you can actually do this. It's just beautiful. So isolation level is defined essentially by the behavior that you want to avoid from that transaction. This is actually where you can define that as a property of a single transaction, not as a collection of transactions. So we can look at one such example. Here's one thing uh, that you might not want in the serializable case. It's a anomaly called a dirty read. What do we mean? Essentially, we say a read, uh, a read operation or instruction is dirty if it was written by a different uncommitted transaction. Okay? If your read instruction is written from the output of a transaction that's not committed yet, then that's called a dirty read. So dirty read, right? So essentially, it might be a value that never exists inside a database because that transaction you are reading from could abort. When that transaction abort, you are actually reading a value that never exists in the, inside a database. That's why it could cause problem. So essentially, again, dirty read need two transactions to exist, right? Because you need to read from a dirty one, right? So assuming you have these two transactions, the first transaction increase enrollment by 1,000. The second transaction just uh, compute the sum of enrollment. Assume you have these two transactions. And if you look at a specific way of mixing their instructions. For T1, what do you do? Well, you could say, yeah, I read the x value, uh, <coughs> and then I increase that by 1,000. I write it back, then I read another enrollment value of another college, I increase by 1,000, I write it back. And, T, and T2 could say, yeah, I read X, I read Y, sum them together, and output. You could mix them in different ways, right? So what about you do this? You update X, then you do the statistics, you do the aggregation, then you update Y. Assuming you start from a state that X is 1,000, Y is 100, what would you have? In this case, right, after T1 update X, after it's read it back, the database is going to have 2,100 there. 
And then T2 comes in, okay? Start to read X and also read Y. It's going to output essentially 2,100 as the sum. And then T1 comes in, update Y, going to commit. If you look at this schedule, this read instruction is dirty. Why? Because the value I'm getting, the x value, is 2,000. 2,000 is the change that T1 made, but T1 hasn't committed yet. That is why we call this, dirt, uh, this read operation a dirty read. Why? Why would that be a problem? Because assuming instead of T1 commit, T1 abort, users say, I want to cancel T1. In that case, what should you do with T2? If you cancel T1, you need to roll back. Then the value of X is not 2,000 anymore. In that case, you also need to roll back T2. But what, T, what if T2 commit before that? That will cause a problem. That's going to break the durability thing, right? Because you need to abort T2 if you allow T2 to commit before you know whether T1 is going to commit or not. Uh, there are different ways database is going to enforce it. Database can tell user, okay, you wait, you cannot read it. I will wait T1 until the commit. So you can have all those locking, latches type of thing, right? That's one way to enforce isolation. There's another way is to say, you guys run whatever you want to run, before you commit, uncheck. That's called snapshot isolation, we are gonna talk about that next week. There are two different ways that database is going to uh, enforce isolation depending on the assumption about how frequent this will happen, right? Make sense? So this is dirty read, right? This is one anomaly behavior that we might not want, and in the serializable case, we will not allow this, okay? So the level read and committed, this isolation level, is to say, if a transaction is in this level, I allow you to have dirty read. Okay, so by default, right, so I, I'm serializable, I will not allow you to have this, but if you say, okay, I know you could have dirty read, but I don't care. For this transaction, I don't care whether you are reading and committed the value or not, because I'm a user, I know more. You can actually set this transaction uh, as uh, in the level of read and committed, right, and then this schedule will be allowed under read and committed level, but not allowed under the serializable level. Essentially, by, by having a lower, like, like, like weaker notion of isolation, you can actually uh, allow more type of schedules, right? Yeah. Sorry, let me see. Yeah. So the benefit of the weaker isolation level, right? So the system could be faster because it, it, it actually allow more type of instructions, more parallelism, right? Uh, and also in some applications, you might not care about this at all, right? If you only care about the aggregation, for example, the average, you'll say, yeah, maybe some read is dirty, but my average will probably be the similar, I don't care that small error you are introducing, then why wait, right? You could say, yeah, this thing is like, a, uh, you can set whenever you write T2, you can say, yeah, I set the transaction as level, the, the isolation level in, into read and committed, meaning that, yeah, you could have dirty read, like out of this transaction. And you can make that a little bit stronger. Well, read and committed is really, is really weak, okay? So you can have something a little bit stronger, but not as strong as, uh, as uh, serializable. You could have another level called read committed, meaning that, a transaction cannot do dirty reads. Okay? All the reads that you have need to come from a committed transaction. Right? It's stronger than read and committed. What do, what, what, what do we mean by stronger? Stronger means the set of schedules that you allow at this level going to be strictly a super set of what you would allow in the read and committed level. But still doesn't give you serializability. So why? Because there are other type 
of read write anomalies I could have. So let's look at this example. In T1, I'm updating the student GPA, increasing them, and then in T2, I run these two queries. I do an average of GPA, and then I do a max of GPA. These two, uh, two different statements. And I set the isolation level of T2 to read committed, meaning that every single read you have need to come from a committed transaction. And the thing we want to understand is whether that's enough, whether that will give you suitability, what other type of anomalies that we have in the system, like, like uh, apart from dirty read. The way to reason about this is by looking at, for example, this schedule. You have T2, you compute the average of GPA, then you update your GPA, then you compute the max GPA. The first thing is, if you look at the schedule, do we have dirty reads in this case? Let's think about that. T1, write everything and commit in the middle. T2, do an average before T1 and do a max after T1 committed. Exactly. So this one will, will be allowed if you have the level called the read committed because you do not have dirty reads. But is this theoretical? I kind of click the button one step earlier. <laughs> is this theoretical? Yeah. It's actually not theoretical at all, right? How, how can this be theoretical, right? So to be theoretical, I want these two, uh, the, like these two queries returns the average and max GPA of the same state of the, of the, of the, of the database. So either it's equivalent of running T1 first, run T2, or then run T2 first, or run T1. One of this. This schedule will give you none of that, right? So it's not actually theoretical. So, but it's really committed because all the read are not dirty. So we are missing some other ways to talk about consistency or uh, like uh, anomalies when you have multiple of those transactions together. So that gives you another level stronger than read and committed. Uh, sorry, than read committed. It's called repeatable read. That's another level. Essentially, this level says, first one, the transaction cannot do dirty read at this level. It's kind of strictly stronger than read committed. Second, an item, if you read multiple times of that, cannot change value. Repeatable read, as the name implies. When you read multiple times, it's repeatable. Okay? I read the same thing twice, I get the same value. If the execution schedule satisfies this, it will be allowed under the level repeatable read. Now let's think about this schedule. The old schedule, the same thing. You do average, you update, you do max. This one is not allowed under repeatable read. Why? Because I read the same thing twice. One before the update, another after the update. If you look at this, right, you read the same thing twice, I get different value, so it's not allowed under repeatable read. Make sense? So essentially, repeatable read is something that's stronger than read committed because we just found one example that is allowed under read committed because there's no dirty reads, but not allowed under uh, repeatable read. But still, it doesn't give you survivability. So there are other type of anomalies. Now let's look at what that is. So look at this example. I have T1, okay? I have... Um, two attributes of student. I have the GPA, I have a semester. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I increase the GPA, I increase the semester, for example. And then I have another transaction. It's repeatable read, uh, that's what I want. The first query computes the average of GPA, the second query computes the max of semester. If you look at this schedule, is that serializable? First one, is that like a repeatable read? 
whole thing that's repeatable read this line. Yeah, exactly, right? You are reading different objects, right? So of course it's repeatable because for every single object you read once. So because of that, this thing is actually repeatable read in most of the database systems if you read them at the attribute level, okay? So, but on the other hand, clearly it's not, it's not theoretical, right? So that is the problem. And then there's actually another problem that separate repeatable read and theoretical. So essentially, look at this schedule. In T1, I insert 100 new students. Okay. In T2, I have two queries. I do the average GPA and then I do the max GPA. If I mix them in this way, Is this one in repeatable read? Who thinks in repeatable read? Not in repeatable read? This one is actually in repeatable read because there are two collections of students. One is the student already there. Well, you read them twice, right? They're the same value, I never update any of those. There are those new students inside the system. I also read them once, right? You have them in the middle, you insert them in the middle. I read them once. All the reads are repeatable in this case. But clearly it's not theorizable, right? Because it's very easy to see they are not really consistent. So this is one example that's repeatable read, but actually not theorizable. So this is actually one thing that we call Fenton tuples. That is, you actually start to insert stuff into the relation in the middle. Because you introduce new objects, right? Your, 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 your next read could be on those new objects. Your older read will not, be all those, uh, like will not be on those new objects. Even though the inconsistency is very clear, you do not read. I mean, your, all your reads that happens are actually repeatable. So this is actually another example. So by looking at this, so, oh, so yeah, so th there's another thing you can cite, which is not an isolation level, uh, called read-only, okay? You can actually tell the system, okay, I have a transaction. Uh, this transaction is read-only. So I only read the stuff. I do not write anything. It's not, a, it's not an isolation level, but uh, it's something you can cite. So essentially, uh, why do people do this? It can actually help the system to optimize the performance of the query. Just go to the one extreme, right? If, you, if all of your uh, transactions are read-only, then nothing needs to be done. It will be serializable no matter how you run it, right? Because you update nothing, right? So you only read stuff, and the thing you read doesn't change, right? So that's one extreme case. In practice, right, so it's not as extreme as that, but knowing a transaction will not change stuff can actually give you a whole bunch of information about how to optimize it. So essentially this is a thing that you can do, right? So in uh, the SQL standard, you are able to do at least these four different levels of isolation. There's a read and committed, there's a read committed, there's repeatable read, there's readable, okay? And each one of them is going to allow some type of anomalies. If you have read and committed, pretty much you can do whatever you want. These two transactions just, just run, okay, without thinking about this. It's going to have dirty reads, it's going to have non-repeatable reads, it's of course going to have all the front-end tuples, okay? But if you don't care, it's fine. There are applications you don't really care about that. And then why do you pay the cost? You just say, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. All of this will, will, will happen and doesn't really matter to me. You can go stronger. If you go read, and, uh, read committed, you say, okay, I do not allow dirty read because that will cause problem for my application. I really do not want that. So, but uh, I'm okay if you have non-repeatable read, 
I'm okay if you have front end tuples and fire. Okay? And then you can make that even stronger when you have repeatable rate, but you do not allow dirty rate, do not allow non-repeatable uh, non rate. But you allow front end tuples. You can go down to say theorizable. I really want everything to be theorizable, right? Then you have uh, kind of get, try to get rid of all those anomalies. So again, if you go from the bottom to the top in the system level, uh, you are faster because you allow more type of schedules. By default in SQL, uh, if you do nothing, it's going to be theorizable. But as you already see, like uh, in practice, it's often a little bit more delicate. Uh, there's always special cases. For example, if you do MySQL at least eight, uh, the default level is actually repeatable read. If you, uh, depending on which engine you use, but there exists some database, exists some instantiation of that where the default is not theorizable. Okay? When you use the database system, when you are worried about transaction and isolation, make sure you double check. Okay? In a SQL standard, st uh, like in a SQL standard the, the, the default is always theorizable, but not always the case. Okay? So that's all we have for today, actually. So from Friday, we are going to talk about how to enforce each of those properties. So we will start uh, from isolation and also enforce that by locking and waiting. Yeah, I'll see you guys on Friday.